Greetings, Ian from RTL here. Welcome to another Saturday morning with Richard. Good morning, Richard. Good morning, Ian. How are we? Ah, oh, we're not too bad at all. Saturday morning again. Yeah. Weeks are getting past. No, I know. I always find it when I do my ladies' day. It comes around too quick. Mm -hmm. It's on the last, <laughs> last Tuesday, so you'll like this week's Shania Twain. Look forward to that one. Yes. So today, instead of doing our like our best slot we've been doing, this one's a little bit different. This is disappointing albums from our favourite artists, basically. So um, we haven't got no bubbly nunders today. They're just dishonourable mentions <laughs> that nearly made the list, but quite didn't quite. As usual, Richard goes first. I'll go second. And we'll take it from there. This one will be interesting. I'm looking forward to this. Well, as I said to Ian, um, the way I'm doing this is uh, disappointing albums on the first few listens. Now, some of these albums have really gone up in my estimations. Some have uh, remained disappointing and some are sort of mid-table for these artists. And the first one that um, I was so disappointed in was from 1973 and it's Cat Stevens' Foreigner. Now, I had got into Cat Stevens through The Greatest Hits, and then I went back to get Tea for the Tillerman, Tea on the Fire Cat, and Mona Bone Jackman, which are really three acoustic singer-songwriter albums with absolutely brilliant melodies. Foreigner is something completely different. The first side is one full track called Foreigner Suite, which I thought was unlistenable. And it's a real band effort. You don't get that lovely acoustic uh, ballady type Cat Stevens song, even though there's some slow songs on them. And the slow songs are like dirges. The single was The Hurt, which it was a half decent song, but the rest of the album I couldn't stand. Now, through time, I've actually got to really like this album. Um, but it is through time. And Foreigner Suite, I think, is actually a, a genius track, even though at the time I couldn't even get the whole way through it. So my number 10, and it has really gone up. It's in my top five Cat Stevens albums, and it is Foreigner from 1973. I don't, I'm not, I've only got like a Greatest Hits album, so I can't really comment on that one, but I get where you think. I think we've got lots of albums like that. We've all got albums that over time we do eventually like them. So my first one, and you're not going to like this. <laughs> It's the one that me and Richard of the Queen collection that we have different opinions on it. I'm going from 1982, Hot Space Queen. Yeah, I know. Um, okay, I'll go about the positives first. Under Pressure, of course, is, is brilliant. I like Put Out the Fire. And that's Par Parbrost de Amour. But the rest of the album... I've never really got into it. The only thing I like about Dancer is probably the only time that they let Brian May play a guitar solo. I love the guitar solo in that. That's brilliant. But the rest of the album should be put in the bin. <laughs> I just don't like them. That should have been left for a Freddie Mercury solo album. I would have accepted it as a Freddie Mercury solo songs, but as Queen songs, nah. So really, you like the standard Queen tracks that you know could have fit on any of the other albums. Yeah, I but just don't like their disco. One track on that album called "Calling All Girls," which I think is one of their best ever pop songs, the Roger Taylor one. I love "Staying Power." I, do, I love the horns on it, but I do agree with you. It probably would have been better served on a Freddie Mercury solo. But I just think the album works as a whole. There's a certain feel to that album that I absolutely love. For example, the, the game, which came out in 1980, everybody raves about that. But I think that, to me, is like a collection of decent songs just thrown together, like almost like a compilation album, you know. Uh, but this one has a feel throughout the whole of the record, which makes Hot Space one of my favourites. It's actually my favourite of, of the 80s. So. Yeah, I mean, he got to number four, so someone liked it. Yeah, but it didn't stay very long. <laughs> no, I think most of us put it at number four, and then, oh dear. <laughs> and the single, the best, the best single, the best-selling single, apart from Under Pressure, which was a year before, really, 
uh, was Las Palabras de Amor, which uh, I think got to number 17 or something. And that's even with a Top of the Pops appearance, which was pretty rare in those days for them to do that. And it still didn't claim any higher. But still, I love the album and I can understand people hating it. My number nine is from the Electric Light Orchestra and it's 1983 and it's Secret Messages. Now I got into ELO heavily by buying their albums, you know, in the late 80s, 88 or so. And I always loved the Rock and Roll as King uh, single, even though I'm not that keen on it now. And um, as I was buying the albums, one of them I got was Time, which I thought was absolutely magnificent. And the next one was Secret Messages. And I loved the album cover and I played the album and I thought it was dreadful. The, the single Secret Messages I didn't really like at the start. And there's a couple of songs like Train of Gold and Letter from Spain, which I thought were absolutely awful. Um, Four Little Diamonds, which was a single as well, sounded too much like um, a, a weakened version of Don't Bring Me Down, which is not one of my favourites anyway. Uh, I just thought it was an absolute mess. Now, to give it its credit, it was originally going to be a double album, and I've since got the reissued double album, and it is ten times better. For some reason, they picked some songs that just were not good enough. And to me, it was a disappointing album. And it's still one of my least favourite ELO albums. And that's Secret Messages from 1983. Yeah, I agree. I mean, when I got the the double Secret Messages, you just sit down and wonder why they left some of them tracks off. I mean, they that, that was like, there are two albums out of their uh, collection, that and The Balance of the next one, the balance of power, are the and um, I like bits and bobs off them, but like you, they're not outstanding. They're just non memorable tracks, to be quite honest. Okay, my next one is from 1986, and it's the Rolling Stones' "Dirty Work." For starters, I hate this cover. <laughs> I mean, talk about um, put them. And they look uncomfortable. That's the thing. They look uncomfortable. They just don't like it. Um, okay. I think the best track on there is Harlem Shuffle and Out at Doubts. And I like the little 33 second highway second, you know, <laughs> that bit of piano. But even the Rolling Stones succumb to 80s um, production. You know, you don't do that to Charlie Watts as a drummer. That's just disrespectful in my eyes it's my least favorite rolling stones album i very rarely put it on because i've got home shuffle on a uh greatest hits album so that suffices me and it still remains one of my dis most disappointing rolling stones albums ever i even prefer the um satanic one to that one Oh, I much prefer Satanic Majesty's Request. I don't mind. Uh, I, well, I'll put it this way. Whenever I first heard Dirty Work, I bought it in the week of the release, and I thought it was okay. I didn't think it was anything special. Um, it has gone down for me, but as I say, initially I thought it was all right. Uh, I quite liked One Hit to the Body, which, um, again, it's gone down as well. It's got a, It's just a bit repetitive. And I quite like the uh, Sleep Tonight and Too Rude. Too Rude is like the wee reggae cover by Keith and Sleep Tonight is the uh, Keith song as well. But generally speaking, it is um, in the lower echelons of the Stones discography. But as I'm going by initial ones, I wasn't going to include it because I didn't quite mind it at the time. I think it's just it was just an album of the time, wasn't it? I think so. Yeah. And uh, they they weren't getting on well at all, like their Jagger and Richards were at each other's throats. So my number eight is uh, from my favourite female singer, and it's from 2005, and it's Tanita Tickerham and Sentimental. And this was the follow-up to her 1998, or is it 97, album, the Cappuccino Songs, which was a good album. It wasn't overly special. But whenever I got this and I put it on, it was a dirge. It was jazzy. It was slow. And, oh, I couldn't even finish it. And I filed it away for years. And it must have been about seven years before I played it again. And I was doing a bit of work at home. And I was working on a computer. And I thought, right, you know, I'd already ripped it to the computer. So I'll play this. 
and I played it while I was working and it sort of went in money right the other. So I played it again. I thought there's some decent little songs in this and I played it the third time and I really enjoyed it. And I played it then the fourth time, stopped the work, sat down, listened to the album and I thought it was brilliant. So from being the worst to need a ticker room album for me, it is now my favourite. So it just goes to show first impressions don't always last. Uh, there's some beautiful songs on it, like Don't Let the Cold, actually a um, uh, duet with Nick Lowe, big Nick Lowe fan. And My Love's absolutely beautiful, played again, gorgeous. It is jazzy, but once those melodies get into your head, they stick and it's a beautiful, beautiful album. And as I say, it's now my favourite of her albums. And that's Tina Tickerham, Sentimental from 2005, my number eight. Well, I'm not going to say too much on that because I've been, uh, she is sort of in the um, Ladies' Day list. But I like sort of that jazzy sound. I, You know, I thought it, I thought it was a half-decent album when I first heard it. But if you're not really, you've got to be really into the jazzy sound. But I'm glad you, it's grown on you because it is, it is a good album. Okay, my number eight. Now, this might be a surprise to you from 1975. Bowden's Zip Gun. Yeah, okay. <laughs> oh, okay. I like Light to Love, Zip Gun, Boogie. Hey. But I think he was madly in love, wasn't he, with Gloria Jones at the time? <laughs> and he would have done anything she asked. <laughs> There's That's too true. much influence from her on that album. And I think that's why it uh, didn't chart over here, did it? It charted didn't, in Australia. Yeah, there's another reason as well, because um, it's basically the same as the American album Light of Love, which was released about three or four months beforehand. And it was imported to the UK. So the T-Rex fans themselves bought that, which was really um, zip, uh, the Zip Gone album plus minus three songs plus three from the previous album, Zinc Halloy. So really, you were buying the same material all over again, and I think that's a lot to do with it. But I can understand you know, not uh, liking that album at all. I do have a T-Rex album in this. It's not Zip Gun Boogie, or Zip Bull and Zip Gun, but I'll come to that whenever I come to that. Yeah, I mean, obviously I've been listening to it quite a lot. And I've sort of, it's grown on me a bit, but it's still not my favourite, as you know, it's not my favourite album by mm -hmm. Mark or T-Rex. Okay, my number seven is from 1985, and it's Squeeze, Cozy Fan, Tutti Frutti. Now, uh, Squeeze had broken up at the end of 1982, Different and Tilbrook did like a duet album in 83 or 84. And then um, there was a big hoo-ha about them getting back together because Jules Holland had um, come back into the band. And the first single they released off that was the very heavy keyboard or piano led Last Time Forever, which is really just to highlight his piano skills, saying, look, Jules Holland is back. Got the album, and I thought it was the biggest pile of trash out. It was produced by Laurie Latham, who produced Paul Young, and it sounded just like a Paul Young album. I didn't think the uh, songs were anywhere near melodic. It was nothing like the old squeeze, nothing like... Uh, Label to Love, Pulling Muscles from a Shell, Another Nail in My Heart, and it was just overproduced. Now, as time has gone by, I have got to like this a lot more. It's still mid-table squeeze for me. It's not at the bottom, but there's some wonderful tracks on there, like the really overblown uh, No Place Like Home, which is one of the best ever songs. Uh, King George Street, which is another great song, and it's very, um, it's the closest you will get to the old squeeze. But it is like a, an album out on its own because of the production style. They changed it again for their next album, even though it sounds dated as well, but not to the same extent as Cozy Fan Tutti Frutti. So it's an album that's grown on me. It's got a dreadful cover as well. And Glenn Tilbrook's got the worst hairstyle ever. He let it grow long, terrible looking. So it gets my number seven squeeze, Cozy Fan Tutti Frutti. Yes, it wasn't the best cover, was it? It's one of them covers you put in front of the fire to keep the children away, isn't it? You just, <laughs> yeah. What was what was Glenn thinking? 
with that haircut at the time. Okay, my number seven is probably an album you like by this band <laughs> from 1981. It's a number one album for them, and it's Abacab. Genesis. Okay, Abacab. Brilliant. The title track. Dodo and Lurker are just magnificent. Me and Sarah Drain, great. But then it's got some mediocre stuff that should have been banished to a Phil Collins album. And the Who Done It was probably one of the worst tracks in history from Genesis. It is that. It's, not it's an album that's it's got some great tracks. It's a game of two halves, as they say. Mm -hmm. I think side one's got the better tracks, and then you've got Dodo on side two, and then it goes, mm -hmm. in my eyes. It's a very disappointing album. I think it might have had a lot to do with the prog, proper prog was dead, and they were one of the prog bands that was in limbo. What do we do next? Hugh Pagman comes on board and sort of takes them too far in one direction. They they gradually brought it back, but I think that, I mean, the Mama album, the Genesis, that's, that's gone back to what it should be. That was just a blip, I think, and always will be a blip, although they did get Dodo and Lurk right, and they are magnificent tracks. You see, I actually like that album. I agree um, who done it was rubbish, but one of their best ever songs of the 80s is Keep It Dark, which is a very simple song. But it's so effective, and I really love the title track, Abacab, and as you said, me and Sarah G and Dodo Lurker. You know, it's not perfect, but it's um, it's nowhere near the bottom for me for Genesis. Like, I would take that over the Genesis album, and I would also take it over Invisible Touch. And less said about calling all stations, the better. And We Can't Dance, which I think is dreadful as well. So I do quite like it. Uh, my number six is from The Clash from 1980, and it's Sandinista. I was now, right. I just thought it was going to be that one. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> now, I got into The Clash in 1982. I was late to them. I bought a second-hand copy of London Calling, blew me away, went back and bought um, Give Him Enough Rope and the debut album, blew me away. And then I bought a second-hand copy of Sandinista, triple album, thinking, yeah, this is going to be great. And it was dreadful. It was just full of dub, full of funk, not really my type of music at all. And at that time, I would have found it hard to even get a single album out of the triple album. I just thought it was awful, absolutely awful. Now, my attitude has changed a bit since, there, since then. It's still not as good as those first three albums, but it's better than Cut the Crap. And it's probably better than um, Combat Rock as well. There are some decent songs on it, but you have to sort of uh, forget about the first three albums because there's nothing like it. And I suppose that the, the, it was shown by the, the single from 1980, which was Bank Robber, which I think should have been on it, to enhance it a little bit. But um, no, it's, it's not a bad album. It's overblown, and I think a single album, even to this day, would have been okay, but a triple album, far too much. And so that gets my number six. Yeah, if I remember when I ranked them, I think that was pretty low. And I think I said very, very similar to what you said. Too long, too, ma too many tracks. Pick out the best tracks from both all three albums, and you'd have probably had a very solid Clash album. Yep. I totally agree with you. It, 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 it's There are some highlights on there, but uh, overall, <laughs> for me... Okay, my number five is from one of my favourite Canadian rock bands, Rush. This is from 1991, and it's Roll the Bones. Geddy Lee forgot that what a bass was. He was more interested in his keyboard, and poor old Neil was reduced to just doing basic, nothing intricate. Dreamline's the best track, the opening track. Um, Big Whale isn't too bad, but from there onwards, it's just poppy nonsense that just does not fit on Rush's radar. There's none of that. Alex Lifeson's guitar work is minimal, but Geddy Lee's keyboards seem to take centre fault. And it just doesn't do anything for me. I've never been so disappointed in an album. 
I know nothing about Rush. I don't think I've ever heard even a Rush song. I think I might know the Tom Sawyer song, but that's about it. So I can't comment. My number five is by Mark Bolin and T-Rex, and the one I'm picking is Zinc Alloy and the Hidden Riders of Tomorrow or A Creamed Cage in August. Now, why I'm picking this is um, in the very early 80s, a lot of Mark Bolin's catalogue, his EMI catalogue, was all deleted. So as finding the albums, which were very, very difficult, those were the pre-internet days. And I had them all apart from three, and they were being reissued in different sleeves, which is a different story anyway. But my brother was living in Liverpool, and he said, it was coming up to Christmas, and he said, look, I'll get you these three. You can take two of them, and I'll keep one as a Christmas present. So he came back with Bolin Zip Gun, Tanks, and uh, Zinc Alloy in the Hidden Riders of Tomorrow. And I thought, right, I'll take Tanks, and I'll take Bolin Zip Gun, and I played them, and I loved them. And I left the other one uh, for Christmas present because it had a teenage dream on it, which I absolutely loved. And Christmas morning, I couldn't wait. I put it on and I loved the first song. And the rest of the album, apart from Teenage Dream, I thought was crap. Absolute rubbish. It was overblown. Mark Bowen was pretended to be Jimi Hendrix. Um, he was playing all these guitar solos, which I thought were dreadful. And the backing vocals, Gloria Jones, etc., were just so high up in the mix that, you know, it drowned out everything else. And I thought, no, this is a terrible, terrible album. Now, it's, since uh, time has gone on, it's gone up a little bit. It would still be probably my second least favourite T-Rex album behind Golden Zip Gun, even though um, it's not, they're, they're very similar, put it that way. But I think the songs in Golden Zip Gun are actually better formed but there's something about uh, Zinc Alloy, even though I would put it a little bit higher, um, I've grown to like it a lot more. Whereas Zip Gun uh, is going down in my estimations, but they're still two of the worst ones. So my number five is T-Rex, Zinc Alloy and the Hidden Riders of Tomorrow. Yeah, I mean, I, I've, I when I first heard Zinc Alloy, I, I was not too keen on, but like you, it's sort of grown on me a little bit, mm -hmm. a little bit more now. But it's st I still think it's better than Zip Gun. Okay, my next one is probably from one of my favourite guitar players of all time. Sadly, left us this year, and that's Mr. Jeff Beck. And the last thing that he ever recorded happens to be a dreadful thing that he did with Johnny Depp called 18. When it come out, uh, the anticipation of a new Jeff Beck album... <sighs> First track, Midnight Walker, which is just Jeff on the guitar, blew me away. And then Johnny Depp had to open his mush. And it's just uh, rubbish. They do a tr shocking version of Venus in Furs. Absolutely mullered it. And then they go and uh, do Isolation, one of my favourite songs from John Lennon. And they killed that. It is terrible. Johnny Depp should not be allowed anywhere near a record studio ever again. He can't sing. He can play a bit of guitar, but he's not a he's an art he's an actor, not a musician. Stop it. Simple as. <laughs> uh, well, again, I don't know the album, but I do know Jeff Beck is one hell of a guitarist. So he is absolutely brilliant guitarist. And um, he did a lot of work with Rod Stewart, didn't he, in the early 70s? Yeah, yeah. I'm doing Jeff Beck a week on Wednesday. So uh, there'll be lots about that. Well, my number four is a Queen album. And it's from 1986, and it's a kind of magic. And I didn't buy this at the time. Um, I bought it on CD in the early 90s. I, I knew the one Vision single, which I thought was all right, nothing great. The kind of magic I quite like. I quite like Friends Will Be Friends, although I think it's a bit sort of uh, sickening, sickly sweet now. And I hated Who Wants to Live Forever. But I bought the album and I played it, and I thought it was the biggest load of tosh out, especially after the brilliance of Hot Space and the brilliance of the works. I thought this was just mediocre. I thought Side 2, things like Give Me the Prize and Princes of the Universe are awful. And I thought the pain is so close to pleasure is Freddie Mercury's worst attempt at doing a Motown song. Yep. <laughs> one, year, one year 
of Love by John Deacon, I thought it's okay, but it's so dated. Even by 1992, I think I bought that, which was only six years old, uh, the, the album I thought was so dated. However, now it has gone up a little bit, especially side two. Um, I do now appreciate it. it. Don't Lose Your Head, the Roger Taylor one, I think was actually quite good. And I do like Princes of the Universe. So it has gone up a little bit for me. It's still probably in the bottom five or six of their albums. But at the time of first hearing it on CD, terrible. And there was bonus tracks on it, which made it even worse. So... <laughs> Uh, Queen's A Kind of Magic, that's my number four. Okay, my number four is, again, one of my favourite bands. Now, we're now getting into the I don't play these albums ever now. <laughs> so, this is from 1984, and it's Jethro Tull's Under Wraps. Again, the one where Ian Anderson forgot to turn up with a flute. Right. It is absolutely awful. The only track on here that there's a bit of flute is European Legacy, which is pretty good. The rest of it is just electronic drum machines. No guitar from Martin Barr. It's just a pile of dung. <laughs> That's all I'll say about it. It is absolutely awful. Um, not even the live versions sound good. They don't play many tracks off here. I think the only one they ever play is European Legacy, and I think they've only played it on one tour. But the rest of it is just rubbish. <laughs> Again, Jethro Tull's bands, you know, I know about, but I don't think I've ever heard a single track from them, apart from as it, uh, Ring the Solstice Bells, which is on every Christmas CD double compilation. Um, I wouldn't mind actually getting if there is a compilation of their best work. I don't know if there's one available. Yeah, there's a couple out there. There's Original Masters. That's a pretty good one. And the best of Jethro Tell. It's got all the hits on it. And if you if you if you you know are not a part time fan, I would recommend them. Both of them. Yeah. Living in the not... past is on their acclaim. There's all the classics, but steer clear of this one. <laughs> Well, my number three is from my favourite band of the 80s, and I was disappointed in this, and it is the Smiths, Strange Ways, Here We Come. And this was released about a week or two weeks after they had officially disbanded. And it's actually, I've heard Morrissey saying it, or is it Johnny Marr, maybe the both of them saying it's the best Smiths album. To me, this is the weakest of the lot, and I was disappointed. Now, the Single that came out beforehand, Girlfriend in a Coma, I thought was really good. I listened to the album, the first track, A Rush and a Push in the Land that We Live in is Ours. I thought this just sounds like madness. And uh, we have things like Death of a Disco Dancer, which I thought was dreadful. And um, there's another one, uh, Last Night I Dreamed Somebody Loved Me. It was a single as well, but it was such a dirge. You know, it was a, not a great LP track, but a worst single. And I thought this was the first time the Smiths actually sounded dated. Uh, the production of it sounded from a little bit 1987. There's a track on it called Paint of a uh, Vulgar Picture, which just goes on and on and on. And it's nothing like The Queen is Dead, Meet Is Murder or the debut album. And to be honest with you, if they were going to carry on with this sort of stuff, I'm glad that they split up because those three albums I thought were brilliant, this one. It's it's not a dreadful album. There's some highlights like I won't share you as a lovely wee ballad at the end, but you, you know the album just you can't uh, say it's a great album because of about two great songs. And there's one track that everybody loves called "Stop Me." If you heard this one before, and I thought it was awful, really bad. So the Smiths "Strange Ways Here We Come" gets my number three, and it is still my worst Smiths album. Well, I'm not going to tell too much about that because. In May, I am ranking the Smiths album, so I don't want to spoil it. <laughs> but, yeah, I sort of agree with you on that one. <laughs> okay, my number three is from my favourite band ever. Now, when I was thinking about disappointing albums from Status Quo, I discounted the... Um, cover albums because they're just shockingly shite. Oh, awful albums. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, but I put that down to bad management. <laughs> because as okay, I don't like speaking bad of the dead, but Dave Walker ruined status quo. The album I'm going to talk about is from 1988, and it's Ain't Complaining. Yeah. Again, I blame Pip Williams trying to chat, make them an 80s pop band. They'll never be a pop band. They are a boogie rock band, heavy rock band. And there's some absolute shockers on this. Um, good tracks. I don't mind the single, Ain't Complaining. That's quite I, fun. I love that. I absolutely, it sounds like ZZ Top. Yeah. So does with electronics on it. I think it's really, really good. Yeah, I don't mind that one. Um, the, but the best song on there is The Loving Game, one of Rick's tracks. It's proper quo. And the rest of it is just, oh, for God's sakes. Now, when they did a remix of that and brought out the tracks they left off, there are tracks that they left off that should have been on the album. I mean, Burning Bridges is just awful. Yes, it is. It is. And that's when I stopped going to see Quo, when people wouldn't get up and dance to Big Fat Mama and all that. As soon as Burning Bridges on, I hope they get, and you go, I don't want to be part of this. I cannot stand who gets your love. Cross that bridge. They're just terrible tracks. And it's an album that I don't play. I just won't play it anymore because it's awful. Cross that bridge reminds me of a song, a melody of it reminds me of a song that you would actually sing in primary school. It's that bad. Yeah, it is bad. It is, it's... And Pip Williams, again, he, I, I just don't like Pip Williams. I do quite like the other single, Who Gets the Love. I think it's actually quite a good ballad. I No, I do like it. But... And Cream of the Crop. Oh, God. <laughs> I actually do quite like that one, Cream oh. of the Crop. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, I expected you to pick that. My number two is from 1980, and it's an artist I got into really, in 1981. And I went to buy one of his solo albums, and it was the only one in the shop. And my brother says, don't buy it, because apparently it's rubbish. And it's Paul Simon and One Trick Pony. Now, I had the Simon Garfunkel, all the Simon Garfunkel albums, loved them. I had borrowed two of his solo albums, the Paul Simon album from 72, and there goes Raymond Simon uh, from 73, and I thought they were magnificent. And I was looking for Still Crazy after all these years, but the shop didn't have it. So I bought One Trick Pony. And I played the first song, and it was late in the evening. I thought, man, this is brilliant. This is going to be the best album out. My brother is so wrong. The rest of the album was turgid. It was dreadful. It was so boring. It had those electric keyboards or electric piano the whole way through it. The songs just dragged and... I don't think the melodies were that good either. It was just one of the most boring experiences I have with any Paul Simon music. However, as time has gone by, I have got to appreciate it a lot more. And it's now like a mid-table Paul Simon album for me. If you really do listen to it, some of the melodies come out, like um, How the Heart Approaches What It Yearns, I think is really good. Uh, Long, Long Day is very good with a beautiful backing vocalist. I don't know who she is, but it's very, very good. There's still some rubbish on it, like Ace in the Hole, and the title track is terrible. And God Bless the Absentee is a bit boring as well. I think it's the sound of the album more than anything I didn't like, rather than the songs themselves, because the songs do grow on you. And still, I would love to hear a remix of that album to see how good it actually is. But uh, at the time, One Trick Pony, I thought was, you know, worst buy ever. And it's my number two, Paul Simon. Yeah, it is one of the, I'd say it's definitely his blip. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know, these people have come up with these ideas, you know, and you wonder sometimes when you listen to it, was Paul Simon when he was recording this going, I don't think I really like this. Some of the songs you can tell in his voice that he's, he doesn't want to be there. <laughs> but that's but when you look at the lyrics, you read mm. the lyrics off them songs, they're wonderful. Just bad execution, I think, on that album. It was actually a soundtrack to the film we made, which was a complete and utter flop. 
And the, the problem I have with it, it sounded like uh, an album from 1975, not an album from 1980. Because it does have a similar quite sound to Still Crazy After All These Years, but the songs weren't as good. So, uh, One Trick Pony, number two. All right, my number two is an album that came out in 2020. And I've been a big fan of these from day one. And that's Bon Jovi. Now, the album before was great. This house is not for sale. Back on form, I thought. 2020, oh dear. Now, I think I've publicly said this quite a lot. I don't, I know John's voice, there's something wrong with it. And I, I feel for him because I think he was a great singer in the 80s. But this is just, he shouldn't have made this album because he can't sing. And it, it, I was so sad. But I was so disappointed as well. Why make an album when you've got an issue with your throat? Put out a Greatest Hits album. Put out a compilation of live. But don't put an album out. And I think it was too sentimental and flat as a pancake. And it's just a terrible album. Now, there's people say, oh, it's, the, oh, it's wonderful. And I got a lot of stick on Facebook when I turned around and says, this is rubbish. And I got accused of not being a, a John Boat, John Bon Jovi fan. I said, I am, but this is just rubbish. You're allowed to make, if your bands make bad albums, and I don't play it anymore. Yeah, there was a lot of uh, talk about his voice, was it last year, going through the internet, saying how bad it was, and they were isolating his voice from concerts and so forth. Um, it, it, it happens to people like Paul McCartney's voice is shot as well, so it is, and he carries on making music. And there's only so much studio trickery you can do before it makes it sound unnatural. And so, no, I don't know what to say. Like, um, if you can't sing, I don't think he should be recording. No, I mean, he did. I don't think he looked after his voice. Yeah, before this, there's singers that that can still sing and have been around a long time. You know, Biff Byford from Saxony, he can still sing. But then people look out for the voices. That's what it's all down to. It was very disappointing anyway. Well, my number one is from my all-time favourite artist, and it's David Bowie, and it's his 1995 album, One Outside. I was so looking forward to this, and I got it. I raced home, and I put it on, and I thought there's not a single melody in any of these tracks whatsoever. This is terrible. And I tried and I tried and I tried and it just wouldn't happen. So what I finally did was in those days, obviously made mixtapes. I recorded about four of the songs off the album along with some of his greatest hits and played it in the car. And I got used to those four. And then after that, I did the same again. And I recorded another four with a few of his other greatest hits played it in the car and now the album has really gone up for me it's a mid-table boy album but it's the most difficult album ever to get into um the, the, the initial tracks i did quite like where i have not been to oxford town and uh, this heart's filthy lesson which i think is an absolutely fantastic single although it did take a little while to get into that one to be honest no control i thought, thought sounded like the pet shop boys but at least it had a bit of a melody to it and then they rehashed the Strangers When We Meet song from the previous album, The Buddha of Suburbia, which I always thought the Buddha of Suburbia version was better. But it was very, very long. There was a lot of uh, narrative in it. And as I say, it was called One Outside, and they were supposed to do two other ones, which they never did, thank goodness. But now, if you were to say, where would you put that in your Bowie list of his 27 or 28 albums, I would say about 15 or 16. So it has gone up, but I remember being so disappointed at that time. You know, you look at the, some of his, his albums like Tonight and Never Let Me Down, which are worse albums. But on first listening to at that time, I did prefer them, although they were sort of went downhill. This one has gone up, but I hated it at the time. So that's my number one. David Bowie, yep. one. Yeah, I'm not going to say too much because... I'm, but I'm going to do it in two parts. Of course, I'm not going to rank them all in one go, but David Bowie is coming up very, very, very soon. Okay. So it's my number one. I know it's, it's probably my pet hate, and Dave got this right. 
when he knew we were doing this, he got this right straight away. <laughs> My number one is from last year, and it's a band that I, when they first appeared on the scene, I loved them. I thought they were fresh, and they were really good. And now their lead singer, Matt Bellamy, is so far up his own backside, it's unreal. We're talking about Muse, of course, and the will of the people. What a pile of junk this was. I kept, I keep buying them, hoping that they go back to the roots. Mm -hmm. No, this is just, they said it was reflecting on um, their career. Yeah, so much that they rehashed stuff. There's only one good song on this, and that's the one about Halloween. The rest of it is just garbage. And the last song actually sums up this album. Now, I don't very often swear on my channel, but the last song is called We're Fucking Fat. And that's about sums up Muse for me. <laughs> it is just dire. I want them to go back and do a rock album and not this pretentious poppy stuff. They've forgotten about the fans that put them where they are, and that's that's why I just don't like this album. They just got gradually worse from Black Holes. Are they still successful? Yeah, got to number one. Well, there you go. So uh, people like you buying it, that's the thing. <laughs> yeah, we go and buy it, and then we bang it. I mean, I didn't buy this one, though. I listened to it. Fair enough. And I will not buy it. <laughs> so, have you got some dishonourable mentions? Yeah, I go. Th I go through three of them, and one is from nineteen and seventy, I believe, and it's Elton John's "Tumbleweed Connection," which it took me so long to get into it. It's very Americana. There was no hit singles off it, and the only song I knew at the time was "Country Comfort," and I knew that Rod Stewart had covered that. And I thought, uh, that's not really my type of music. No, it's still, I do like it now. And it would probably, it's better than his 80s and 90s stuff. But um, it's still one of the weakest of his 70s for me, um, even though it was a huge hit here and it was a massive hit in America. So that's one of them. Um, another one is the Style Council, and it is The Cost of Loving. There you go, Rob Walker. This is a pile of poo. It's pure manure. That's what it is. Ooh. Now, although I was disappointed with it, I wasn't expecting too much because I knew the single and I wasn't overly keen on the previous album. But um, I couldn't even get through this one at all. It was terrible. Absolute dreadful album. And then they released another single, Waiting, which was the biggest snooze fest out. And then my last one is actually uh, The Rolling Stones. But this is Between the Buttons from 1967. This was my second Stones album that I bought behind uh, after, uh, Aftermath. And I really enjoyed Aftermath. I thought, right, we'll get the next one. And I played it and I thought it was terrible. And um, the only song I knew of it at that time was Yesterday's Papers because it was unrolled gold. I thought, this is just a mess. Um, but as time went on, some songs started to jump up on me. Like the first one was Backstreet Girl, which I thought was a lovely wee ballad. Who's Been Sleeping Here, which I thought was like a Bob Dylan song, and I thought was really good. And I remember seeing Miss Amanda Jones on the um, film Some Kind of Wonderful, I think it was, and I think, ah, that's the Rolling Stones. I have that song. And it sounded great in the film. So I started playing the album again, and I actually really do like it. And it's one of my favourites now of the 60s of, for the Stones, and it's better than Aftermath. But at the time, uh, but I really, really worked on that album to get to like it and i think that's what you have to do sometimes is keep on repeated playing so that's my other one yeah style council this will upset rob a bit i don't like the style council i think it's just the jam brilliant style council i just don't couldn't get into that sound um Warren Stone's album, yeah, Push the Buttons is a hard album to get into, but once I think you get into it, you realise that it is a really good album. Um, my three, my first one is one of my favourite prog bands, Gentle Giant, made some fabulous albums, Octopus being one of them, and then they come out with this joint for a day. 
Now you ask any Gentle Giant fan, and this one's always bottom of the pile. It's Poppy. They're a prog band. I know they wanted to be relevant in 1978, but no one brought this. Because <laughs> it's rubbish. My next one's from 1970, 1997, and it was the last album I brought by you two. And it's certain, and within a week it was um, in the um, charity shop, and it was pop, absolute rubbish. Just didn't like it. Don't like any of the tracks on it. Now my last one is a sort of I've cheated a bit. It's two albums. Now by when a, a great band called Wishbone Ash. The original Twin Guitar Merchants, as I call them, Ted and Andy, great guitar players. And then in 1997 and 1998, they decided to go trance and dance. And trance visionary and psychic terrorism. They are absolutely awful. I... I heard a track off it, and I never brought these albums. I had to listen to them because I've been ranking uh, when I was ranking them, and I got about three tracks on on each. I have never heard a load of rubbish in my life. What were they thinking? You well, could have a brilliant masterpiece like Argos, and then you go and put this shite out. What the? What went through their heads? Luckily, they sort of realised that it was rubbish and went back to doing rock music. But, yeah, two of the worst albums from any of my favourite bands, without a doubt. <laughs> well, well, since you cheated, I'm going to throw another one in here, and this is the ultimate um, zero to hero. And, yes, I was disappointed in this whenever I first heard it. I borrowed a copy from... One of my cousins and I taped it along with Bowie's pinups on the other side of the tape. And it is a David Bowie album. And I liked the singles, but I didn't think much of the rest of the album. But this I did actually buy the album, I taped it, and then I bought it the next year. And it's David Bowie's Diamond Dogs. And that has gone from a slight disappointment. I didn't think it was dreadful. I just didn't think it was that great to the best album ever released by anyone in this earth. So that's the old go. <laughs> so um, it just goes to show if you stick with an album, you know, it, you know, sometimes it does work, sometimes it doesn't. This one really worked for me. Well, that was a really good one, you know. Um, it's nice sometimes we talk about our favourite albums. It's not as so have a have a bit of a dig at them and go, what are you doing, boys? But or girls. But there we go. As ever, it's always a pleasure to work with Richard. Um, I know we're coming up something for the coronation. We've not got long to sort this one out, have we really now? No, we haven't. No. Uh, I'll have a think. <laughs> yeah, we'll have a think. Um, but that's all for today. Um, I might do something tomorrow if I get everything else done. But I'll definitely be here on Monday where we're going to, we've been talking about the Rolling Stones and we're going to look at Ronnie Wood's solo albums and there's some really good ones in there. And we've got an absolute belter of a classic album. It's If You Can Believe Your Ears and Eyes by the wonderful Mamas and Papas, a band that I like and I know Richard likes. I only know their hits. I've got one greatest hits. So it's very, yes. very good. But they're a very good band. So once again, thank you very much, Richard. It's always a pleasure. And as I said, I'll do it publicly to everyone else. Thank you for your help with the competition. Went very well. Got more people than I thought. Picked up so many subscribers. It just sees how many I'm going to lose now. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so as I would say, it's goodbye from me. And it's goodbye from him. <laughs>